we are entering a new phase now. Uh, the last phase of Kali Yuga before the collapse. And it is essential now for Sat Yogis to attain the realization of non duality. <clears throat> and this is not so easy because the ego mind cannot grasp non duality. And it cannot be adequately taught with signifiers, with language, because language is embedded in duality. And so although there is a great deal of very sophisticated philosophical discourse that attempts to prove the truth of Advaita or non-duality, uh, those words, even when one reads them deeply, do not tend to lead to the realization of non-duality. And because of the subtlety of the arguments, that are involved in recognizing the falseness of maya, of this illusory world, uh, are so um, inherently ambiguous. Uh, they can be interpreted in a number of ways, which is why there are many schools of Advaita let alone other schools of non-duality in the Buddhist traditions and even in the Christian and Jewish traditions and the Taoist, of course, etc. But non-duality is not a discourse, not a philosophy. It is the realization that only is attained when the mind, the thought-producing mind, which is embedded in duality, stops functioning, but stops functioning while the consciousness that had been employing and identifying with language, with thoughts, remains alert, awake, and attuned to that which is real that emerges in consciousness when the thoughts fall away. And so although there is a wide variety of philosophies and discourses of non-duality through different traditions, the practice of yoga is the same. The practice of silencing the mind while remaining in natural, wakeful, naked awareness, as the Buddhists would, at least the, the Tibetan Buddhists would tend to uh, refer to it, or the, that state which is the Atman, the self that is uh, not an object of thought. And that perceives what the ego calls the world as itself, as not separate from itself. The Buddhist formula, samsara is nirvana, nirvana is samsara. But that formula is still in duality because there is no samsara and no nirvana. And as the great sages always uh, emphasize, liberation from maya is not actually attained. It is just that ignorance drops away. The ignorance that obscures the fact that we always already know all of this because we are all this and there is nothing but this. But the discourse of the ego produces an obscuring of the truth of what we are, the truth of the real. 
what we discover if we analyze the nature of the situation from a psychological perspective is that when, when the ego mind is created in infancy, even in the intrauterine state, a proto-ego is already present that imbibes the subconscious mind of the mother, and even in the fetal state, and the energy field, and the relation of mother and father, and the family system. All of that is already in a non-verbal way in place. And then once language is acquired, the signifiers become attached to those original affect states. So if one was extremely traumatized, one's thoughts will then be uh, connected to those uh, traumatic feeling states. And the kinds of uh, thought patterns then that will tend to repeat in the program of the ego will uh, tend to keep one in a state of fear of the real because the original encounter with the real in the womb or during birth, if birth was traumatic or in early infancy or whenever in childhood, a, an event comes that cannot be accommodated, that stops the going on being and stops the ability even to suture the, uh, the shock of an unexpected violation uh, or abandonment or uh, rejection or whatever the trauma consists of uh, produces a kind of glitch in the program in which one cannot get beyond that point at which one defines oneself in relation to that trauma and perhaps says, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't exist, I'm not lovable, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. And the, uh, the ego becomes afraid of the real. And, and we call the real at the level of ego, real one. Because real one is that level of the phenomenal plane that can't be, uh, can't be avoided, but can't be uh, uh, dealt with uh, adequately with language or with normal kinds of reactions. It is, it is that aspect of of real one, the physical reality that is inherently traumatic, such as physical pain and bleeding and vomiting and dealing with all the various aspects of real one that are extremely unpleasant, including illness and, uh, and various other kinds of, uh, uh, of either disgusting or, or just unbearably horrible, painful, uh, indigestible aspects of physical reality. And then defenses and buffers get created against that, that produce the kind of a personality strategy and the kind of defenses and avoidances and repressions that produce a particular form of ego structure. It takes a long time once uh, a traumatized ego begins to develop higher uh, layers of mentation that can function uh, beyond the, uh, the glitch of the repressed trauma. And it tends to then want to live in a symbolic world that is imaginarized. It wants to produce an imaginary form of enlightenment even, an imaginary form of uh, spirituality, imaginary relationships to an imaginary God in religious terms. And, uh, and it will cling to those because it can produce hallucinatory satisfactions and gratifications, but that, it, that remain uh, within the ego construct and that the ego can then use as a discourse to support its, uh, its justification of itself, its sense of goodness, its uh, ability to relate in a way that it can feel uh, 
that it fits in, that it's acceptable, even that it is lovable, but there's a, uh, a terror underneath this, a terror that is not, uh, is never really eliminated because uh, the, the terror itself is so unbearable that it creates a secondary feeling of shame that it has such terror. And then that kind of shame, and the shame is just about having a body and being a body that is subject to such uh, horrific and embarrassing and ridiculous and horrifying real one phenomena. And of course, school children make fun of many of these real one phenomena and try to uh, to uh, deal with them through ridicule and bullying and all of the various other ways that children can be cruel to one another. But uh, that, of course, increases the shame and, and the sense even of guilt then if one participates in those kinds of uh, violative uh, actions that produce uh, a, such a defense against getting to the deepest core of the ego's uh, rejection of the real, let's say, that uh, it produces screen fears that are not the real fears. It pretends to be afraid of other things. This is how people produce phobias. I can pretend to be afraid of a mouse. I'm not really, or a spider, or whatever else. And, uh, and those things, although I can get hysterical about them, somewhere I know I'm not really afraid of those things. But those phobias then will produce a screen defense against what one is really terrified of. And then, of course, one creates also screen desires to try to keep moving away from the feared object and the anxiety that is objectless because it's the real itself. Uh, that uh, that the, uh, the ego becomes obsessed and it, uh, it moves toward objects that are always uh, illusory uh, forms of projection of a, a kind of rescue from reality itself. But of course, it's doomed to failure. So the, the ego cannot, once it has formed around this defensiveness, it cannot love in the real sense because it cannot open its heart and release the defenses because along with love will come the shame and the terror. <clears throat> and so it, uh, it tends to play with those uh, feelings but not to enter fully into divine love, which we would say is love of the real, because the real itself is the source of one's terror. As one becomes more um, sophisticated in one's ability to analyze or psychoanalyze one's own condition, one is able to gradually uh, deconstruct and open up various of the layers that are producing the, uh, the suffering that is always a, a byproduct of the defenses and the closed heartedness and the imaginary relationship to reality. But the ego can never open itself up totally because the one doing the opening is always uh, not going to open its own internal knot that contains uh, the core of the trauma. And, uh, and thus, its own unconscious core, the sensor, will always make sure that whatever is understood does not get too close to that ultimate barrier uh, against, uh, against the fear of just completely depersonalizing and going into psychosis because of an inability to cope with uh, the 
the affects and the energies. But they will reappear in one's life in the form of rejection and uh, uh, various other forms of uh, suffering and anxiety, which can reach very heavy levels. And of course, karma, which can produce uh, attacks upon one's uh, reputation, one's goodness, one's sense of uh, well-being and acceptance in the world. And at the same time, there can be nightmares and uh, various forms of uh, intrusive fantasies that come from these deep levels that one can't keep out, and intrusive affects. So people are suffering from these phenomena without understanding them. And because the ego itself is constructed out of these uh, illusory uh, thought forms and images and fantasy structures that are based on the fear of the return of the real, uh, the, uh, the ego produces its world, okay? Uh, and, and that's why, in a certain sense, the Eka Jiva Vada that is often spoken about in Advaita, which in a way you could say is solipsism, to use a Western term, phenomenologically is accurate because the ego only sees its own projections. And its world becomes the, the projections writ large coming back to it.